The national security law in Hong Kong goes into effect starting Wednesday. The United States has begun revoking Hong Kong's special trade status. Is Hong Kong's position as a financial hub in jeopardy? And on the eve of negotiations to resolve the border standoff between China and India, India has banned 59 Chinese applications. Is India prepared to antagonize its largest trading partner? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. On Tuesday, Chinese lawmakers voted unanimously to adopt a law on safeguarding national security in Hong Kong. The law will be added in what is known as as Annex 3 to the basic law of the Special Administrative Region. Shortly before the law was passed, the United States Commerce Department announced the decision to suspend preferential trade treatment to Hong Kong, including the availability of export license exceptions. U.S. President Donald Trump announced this process last month, threatening a full range of export controls. China responded, saying intimidation never works. What does the U.S. decision mean for Hong Kong, and why is the U.S. sanctioning Hong Kong in order to protect it? I'm joined from Hong Kong by Cam Man Phun, Deputy Secretary General of the One Country, Two Systems Youth Forum, and in Beijing by Lu Xiang, Director for Research at the Chinese Institute of Hong Kong. But first, let's take a listen to what uh, Kerry Lam, the Chief Secretary of the Hong Kong SAR, said. Tuesday during a press briefing. We may find alternatives to those products in many other countries around the world. The impact of the U.S. decision on Hong Kong will be very, very small. Any sanctions will not scare us. We are prepared. When necessary, I believe that the central government will also take countermeasures. We will do our best to cooperate on the countermeasures proposed by the central government at the diplomatic level. So a message of confidence and defiance there uh, from Hong Kong. Mr. Cam, on what basis do you think she is making this uh, assessment that uh, the U.S. sanctions would have very, very small impact on Hong Kong? Yes, actually, uh, what uh, Pompeo said is about those uh, military equipment and also the dual technology that is very sensitive to the weapons, to the military use. But if we look at the, to those numbers, then most of those uh, dual technology or those uh, military equipment actually is, is a very small portion from USA to Hong Kong. Which, and also, uh, uh, our uh, chief executive, Kerry Lam, also mentioned that uh, there are a lot of substitution around the world. Even U.S. Uh, banned the uh, uh, exportation to Hong Kong, uh, those uh, uh, corporations can still find other substitution around the world, like Europe. Mm -hmm. So I think the, uh, the inference is not that big, even up with this uh, section. The United States, uh, says Pompeo, is forced to take this action to protect U.S. national security. We've heard that very often. He also says we can no longer distinguish between the export of controlled items to Hong Kong or to Chinese mainland. Uh, Mr. Liu, um, how big of a deal is this for Hong Kong or for China in general? And on what basis, according to your understanding, is he making the assessment that because of the new national security law for Hong Kong, the distinction between the uh, Hong Kong SAR and the Chinese mainland is effectively blurred, making it possible for du dual-use technology to be diverted to the mainland? Uh, hi, Liu Xin. Uh, I have two points for this question. Actually, first, uh, first is that uh, to compare it with the interest of the Hong Kong people in in relation to security and the safety and the well-being. Something like this is very very small. Secondly, uh, is that uh, is that actually Hong Kong uh, SAR. Uh, uh, doesn't have an, uh, have an obli obligation for defense or military uh, or military industry. So actually, it doesn't make any sense for the United States to stop export of this kind of equipment. But could it be? So but could it be why, only the first yeah. step, Mr. Liu, and more restrictions, more controls would be further in the pipeline? Is there that possibility, Mr. Liu? 
Yeah, yeah there, there may be a bit possibility for further uh, sanctions, but as I said, compared with the matter of national con uh, security, everything is small, much smaller. Okay. Well, uh, Pompeo also says uh, the move to end defense exports is in response to Chinese efforts to um, limit, let's say, Hong Kong's freedoms. He says we urge Beijing to immediately reverse course and fulfill the promises it has made to the people of Hong Kong and the world. Um, Mr. Kam, is there something wrong with Mr. Pompeo's logic? Does he understand Hong Kong's status vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with uh, the People's Republic of China correctly? Um, I think Mr. Pompeo has some mister misunderstanding to the status of Hong Kong. First of all, we know that Hong Kong is under one country, two system. We enjoy a very high autonomous, but it's not a total autonomous, which means that um, the central government also has the right to make laws, as we know that they will put it in the Hong Kong Basic Law, the endless uh, free. And this is all a uh, process with the uh, the process of the uh, NPC, the National People's Congress. And under the basic law, we still, I mean the Hong Kong people, we still enjoy the human rights and the freedom of speech. So even the national security law will become an uh, NS3 in uh, our basic law. The Hong Kong people, we still, I'm, I'm very positive, we still enjoy the human rights and also the freedom of speech. That has been set out in the law, although people are saying exactly uh, what will be the reality after the implementation. We really have to wait and see, but I think the determination to safeguard Hong Kong's people's uh, rights and freedoms, legitimate rights and freedoms, have been spelled out very clearly in relevant uh, pieces and documents. Um, but according to the Commerce Ministry, U.S. Commerce Ministry statement, they say, we urge Beijing to immediately reverse course and fulfill the promises it has made to the people of Hong Kong and the world. Uh, Mr. Liu, is Beijing likely to change course? Is there any possibility of that? Is the United States aware or not aware of Beijing's resolve in pushing through this law, um, underlined by the importance and urgency of the situation? Uh, actually, the comments from the U.S. side is not only wrong, it's just, uh, it just senseless. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, uh, for the well-being of the Hong Kong people, we have to have a national security law uh, over uh, in this territory. And uh, in the second half of last year, we, we saw uh, how people suffered how business uh, suffered. Uh, so so uh, this time, uh, now is the right time for, for the uh, People's National People's Congress to impose this kind of um, law upon Hong Kong. And this is uh, purely for the well-being of Hong Kong people. Hong Kong people are people of China, and uh, there's no other, uh, not, no other country like the Chinese uh, government to, uh, to take care uh, of them, uh, yeah, we, we have uh, only the Chinese government will protect them. So uh, this time we see uh, with the passing of this new law, uh, I, I think the stability of Hong Kong. But precisely, guarantee. precisely yeah. the the use of the word "impose" is what many people outside of China have a problem with. They're saying this is not something that Hong Kong people need. This is not something that Hong Kong people want. This is something that Beijing wants and uh, uh, added with force, let's say, imposed on Hong Kong. Uh, Mr. Cam, how do you react to? To such kind of uh, ideas and uh, exactly what is the legitimacy and, uh, uh, and urgency, let's say, of the central government and the necessity of the central government to enact such a law and implement it in Hong Kong? Yes, of course, every law that there are supporters and some people will against it, that's true. But let's see, this law is the national security law. It's, it's not just uh, with Hong Kong, it's with the whole country. You have to understand that. So even some of the Hong Kong people, they may ac disagree with the law, but as the central government, you know, we, we are facing a very critical moment in, in, in the world that we have uh, a lot of conflict now, and especially we have the trade war with uh, USA, and Hong Kong now as a city enjoy 
high autonomous with a lot of freedom that it may cause uh, weakness point of our national security. That's why as a central government, it has the responsibility and also the power and the right to make this law to protect the security of the whole country. There seems to also be the understanding, Mr. Cam, that Hong Kong's status as a global financial center resulted in the U.S.'s mm. special treatment of the city. Is that the case? Is that accurate? And uh, if, that is, um, if there is any connection, will Hong Kong's status as an international financial center, as a global financial center, be impacted, be damaged with the U.S. decision? Um, as an international financial hub or financial center, uh, it is not just made up by one country, but all different parties. So, of course, U.S. It has the uh, biggest financial power in the world. Of course, if those uh, people from Wall Street, if they are skeptical to, to the status of Hong Kong, there may be some short-term uh, damage or short-term short -term inference. But look, uh, we have to understand that there are always two different ideas. From, from the United States. One is from the White House and the other is from Wall Street. For the people from, of the Wall Street, what they think about is not uh, the, the political status of Hong Kong, but as a financial hub, is it still enjoy the freedom and op openness of the market? I think in the short term, some people may, have, may be skeptical to the status, but after, after maybe for one month or two months, if they figure out that, if they, if they find out that, okay, the freedom and the openness of the Hong Kong market is still as usual as mm -hmm. before, the money will come back. Yeah. Well, I think it does take some time for people to understand the situation, to feel um, uh, mm -hmm. comfortable with what this law really means. However, uh, according to the State Department, Mr. Liu, there are 85,000 U.S. citizens living in Hong Kong, uh, at least in 2018, more than 1,300 U.S. companies operating in Hong Kong, and uh, nearly every major U.S. financial firm is there. So the territory is also a major destination of U.S. legal and accounting services. Why does the United States want to sanction the city, want to hurt the city while claiming to care about the well-being of the city and its people? Yes, yeah, there is a political motive uh, behind your, uh, the, the decision of the U.S. government. But actually, you know, you, you just mentioned that uh, actually the United States have a lot, has a lot of interest in Hong Kong, in, in its political, uh, current political system and uh, in the stability of, uh, of Hong Kong. So, uh, so this is why I actually I don't expect that the, the U.S. will, uh, the U.S. government will do, uh, uh, do uh, will go too too far uh, for uh, for sanctioning Hong Kong. Finally, this question, which is on the mind of a lot of people about the transparency of the draft, uh, the draft is not known at this moment. Uh, by the time we replay this program next morning, we'll have known it uh, by now because this law is expected to come into effect on July the 1st. Uh, Mr. Liu, why the secrecy? Um, what is on the mind of the lawmakers that they didn't, that prevented them from um, having the text of the law um, public and possibly solicit opinion and having public dis debate about it? Uh, actually, you know, it's, a national, it's, a, it's about national security. It's not for people to argue, to debate. Uh, actually, you know, uh, this law is touching at uh, very few people, uh, very few people about uh, their a uh, activities uh, relating to secession, subversion, and uh, terrorism, and the collusion with external forces. So. Uh, it's not targeting at common people. So uh, an, uh, the, life of, uh, the life of the ordinary people will not be affected. So, uh, so this is why I think mm. this law, the draft, is not, uh, is not published right. before it takes uh, it take effect. Okay. We're going to leave it there. Many thanks. More to come in the next days, of course. But many thanks to Kem Pham Phone, Kem Pham Phone, Deputy Secretary General for the One Country, Two Systems Youth Forum, and Lu Xiang, Research Fellow of the Chinese Institute of Hong Kong. We'll take a short break, and when we return, India bans 59 Chinese applications on the grounds of national sovereignty and integrity is a new front opening in the China-India dispute. Stay with us.